Hi, this is a book review of The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. So the premise of the story is our main character, Margaret, receives a letter from Vida Winter, who is one of the most notorious and popular authors at the time. And in this letter, she's asking her to do a biography of her. Now, this is extra special in the sense that Vida Winter is a true storyteller and all the way through her life, when journalists have asked about her and her past, um, she kind of just makes up different stories. She kind of takes snippets from characters that she's developed but never ended up using in her books and different storylines that she never ended up using it and kind of twists and weaves it into what she says her past and her story is. So it gets to the state where every single journalist who's ever asked her about a past comes back with a completely different story. And there's just so many different stories surrounding her and so much mystery surrounding this woman that nobody really does know the truth of who she is or where she's come from. I know she is so, so popular and so treasured um, by the public Obviously, this is a story that people really, really want to know. So the fact that she's chosen our main character, Margaret, um, to Margaret herself feels a little bit strange. She doesn't even know how she's found out about her because Margaret isn't a professional biographer. She's written some biographies, but of kind of very obscure people. Um, and she, she works in the bookshop, uh, which is owned by her father. And she's done lots of research on different people, but everyone she's ever researched has been dead. And she's never done any kind of writing or biography style writing on anyone who is still alive. So the fact that this is someone who's still alive makes her feel a bit, a bit iffy, I think. But she's obviously very, very intrigued. So with that in mind, it's definitely a book for book lovers. Your main character obviously works in a bookshop, her main passion is books, and your other main character is an author and her true sense of who she is, is storytelling. So there's a lot of love for books in here and a lot of love for like words and language. So if you do love books, I think you'll really enjoy that aspect of it as well. Now, it is a beautifully written book. There is some very flowery language and I guarantee you there'll be times when you go back and reread a sentence or a paragraph or even the whole page just to get the full impact of the words and just truly appreciate how, how beautiful the writing really is. Now, I would say this is a book that has a strong focus on families, um, especially with sibling relationships and um, the dynamic of twin relationships and just kind of feeling though as though you're part of a family where you belong and um, there's a lot of talk on on love on grief and it's just a really lovely book about about families and about relationships and i think that really comes across as something that's really special about this book in particular now the setting of the book is in a very ambiguous time. So you never actually get told what era you're in here, but there's this different clues along the way. I think it's set in like the 1920s, 30s, 40s kind of era. And then as you go back in time to hear about Vida's life and the story that she's telling, I think it's going back towards the very late 1800s. And I think it's a really lovely aspect of this book that you don't actually know when it's set. And that's not something I've come across in that very many books at all. And I think it gives it a lovely kind of timeless quality and a really nice kind of, I don't know, kind of an abstract feel from where you are in the sense that it doesn't really matter what era it is set because the focus is so much on families that it feels very just very timeless. So Vida Winter tells the story of Angel Field House, which is a manor house, um, which is the home of the March family. And you start back to earlier generations and you're introduced first to Charlie and Isabel, and they're a brother and sister. And they have kind of a strange kind of dynamic between them. There's some kind of 
thoughts on their kind of mental stability of the two. Isabel is um, absolutely beautiful and Charlie is kind of, it's kind of cruel, um, kind of cold and cunning. And then in the second generation, you're introduced to the twins, Emmeline and Adeline, and they're kind of very wild twins. They don't have much um, kind of parental guidance, I suppose. They're kind of just brought up by the servants in a way, and they're kind of out of control these two twins and then you have some extra kind of secondary tertiary characters you have um a governess you have the missus the like lady of the house you have um the gardener and um another boy who kind of works as like an apprentice in the garden and it's just a really well developed story and the characters are um very detailed and they all have their own different um, nuances and it's just really good. <laughs> so the story twists and turns beautifully and they start uncovering um, lots of different kind of secrets and then as Margaret is uh, listening to the story obviously she's making kind of notes because she's going to be writing all this up she gets more and more seduced by the story and because of this she starts um, conducting her own research on the side so kind of she goes to see Angelfield House and she goes to the village and she starts kind of talking to different people and she's doing lots of extra things that Vida Winter originally didn't really want her to do she wanted her to listen to the story from beginning and then to end and then she didn't want any questions any way through she just wanted to tell her story in the order that she wanted to tell it and the way Margaret's mind works is um, if she heard something particularly, I don't know, particularly anything at all, she'd have like questions and she'd have further questions she wanted to ask and things that she'd want to clarify. And then Vida was like, no, we're going to tell it how I want to tell it. So you as the reader get the same kind of sense of maybe frustration and excitement as Margaret does because you are hearing the story um, in this way. And there are lots of questions that you have and um, you have a character and it, it might move on. You're like, oh, I wasn't I wasn't finished. I wanted to know a little bit more. So um, that's nice that it comes through in the book that you're feeling some of the same kind of emotions and kind of thoughts that Margaret has. So I like that. I thought that was a really nice aspect. So this story was published in 2006 and I've had it on my bookshelf for quite some time now. Um, I decided to read it recently because of obviously quarantine and don't really have access to as many books anymore with the libraries being closed. Um, I originally picked it up actually from my library in a sale uh, for 25 pence. So I thought that was a great bargain and I'm so, so pleased that I picked it up because it is just a wonderful, wonderful story and it's written absolutely beautifully. The language is lovely. Um, I think overall I would give it five stars. It is really, really good in the sense that if I could wipe it from my mind and read it all over again, I absolutely would. It is really, really good. So yeah.